What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Engage It Podcast. I'm your host, Zach, with my two co-hosts, Josh and Mike. Today, we're actually on episode 50 of the Engage It Podcast. It's been a really long road. Uh, it's been a great road, I think. We can all agree upon it. Uh, we've made it kind of far, and we're looking to do great things in the future as we get to 75, 100. So, yeah. But in today's episode, we're going to be going over basically the first 24 to 48 hours of the free agency legal tampering period that started yesterday on Monday, and it is currently Tuesday, March 12th. So everything has been agreed upon, but nothing can get legally finalized until the official league year tomorrow at, I believe, 4 o'clock Eastern. And then we're also going to continue our division recaps of the 2023 season with the AFC and NFC West. But first, you want to get us started with some free agency stuff, Josh? Yeah, I'll open us up on our first segment here for free agency. I'm going to go over all the big-time offensive free agents. Uh, Zach's going to give a couple of his favorites, and Mike is going to go over all the big-time defensive free agents, and Zach will give a couple of his favorites there. Uh, but bear with me because this is going to be a mouthful here. Starting off with quarterback, Kirk Cousins, <laughs> four years, 180 <laughs> mil for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Baker Mayfield resigned, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, three years, 100 mil. Russell Wilson was cut by the Broncos, signed with the Steelers for one year, one mil. Uh, Minshew going to the Raiders. Brissett, Patriots, Jameis Winston signed with the Cleveland Browns. Did you guys catch that? I didn't even see that. Was that what we were hooping earlier today? No, that was this morning. I didn't even see that. Must have been <laughs> must have been catching some Z's on that one. I kind of like that for them. But um, Jameis to the Browns, and then that's basically all the relevant ones. Sam Darnold to the Vikings as well. Uh, moving on to running back, Saquon Barkley signed with the Eagles, three years, 37 mil. He got paid. Took a little bit of a pick up, but he got paid there. Josh Jacobs going to the Packers, four years, 48 mil. In response to that, I believe, where is, is Aaron Jones not on this list? I guess he's well, not. He, Aaron Jones signed, he signed with the Vi- Vikings, He signed right? with the Vikings one year for $7 million. Yeah, okay. I don't know why that's not on here. Okay, Aaron Jones did sign with the Vikings, uh, as I thought. Austin Eckler, Commanders. Tony Pollard, Titans, Derrick Henry to the Ravens, which is just dairy to even scary. imagine how that's going to happen. Imagine that reaction, healthy. then. I know. DeAndre Swift with the Bears. The Monty and Swift uh, debate from the Bears-Lions has now been flipped with Monty on the Lions and DeAndre Swift on the Bears. Um, we're still waiting to hear from a couple guys like A.J. Dillon, Zach Moss signed with the Bengals, uh, Antonio Gibson with the Pats, and then a bunch of people we don't really care about. Moving on. To wide receiver T Higgins franchise tag, but did I see that correctly? He unless I got he requested a trade. Requested a trade. Yeah, Yeah. I did see he requested a trade. So we'll see uh, if he follows through with that or whatnot. Michael Pittman re-signed with the Colts after being franchise tag three years, seventy mil. Good deal for them. Uh, Mike Evans, we already know, two years, forty one. He signed before it started. Darnell Mooney, three years, thirty nine million for the Falcons. My God, is that a bad contract? I Gabe Davis, same contract for the Jags. Um, I would rather have Gabe Davis, but it's me personally. <laughs> um, what else? Noah Brown resigned with the Texans. That's huge. He had a great year last year. Uh, Kendrick Bourne resigned with the Pats. We have a lot of wide receiver dominoes that haven't fallen yet. As I look at this, like there's like 30 names on here, and there's not many that have been signed. Um, trying to think. Oh, and then recently Deontay Johnson got traded to the Carolina Panthers. Uh, so that's interesting. That's a big weapon for Bryce Young. I like that move for them. Uh, do we know the details on that trade? I was we were we were hooping when that one. Yeah. Dante Jackson was... in a sixth. For, oh, right. Uh, we talked about yeah, Deontay, Deontay Johnson for Dante Jackson. Yeah, yeah it, was <laughs> Deontay, just it was Deontay Johnson in a seventh for Jackson, and then a sixth, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, that's a I like that deal for the Panthers a lot. Um, they needed to get a receiver. On, yeah, agreed. Uh, moving on to tight end here, Dalton Schultz resigns with the Texans. Uh, great for them. Another guy like Noah Brown, who was great for them last season. Hunter Henry back on the Pats. Noah Fant back on the Seahawks. Gerald Everett today signed with the Bears for two years, 12 mil. I like that deal for them. Uh, he's a good backup tight end. Kobe Parkinson signed with the Rams, three years, 22 mil. A little bit of an overpay, in my opinion, there. But we move on. Doesn't matter very much. Um, Mike Gusecki signed with the Bengals, one year. TBD, I guess. Um <laughs> Irv Smith Jr. signed with the Chiefs. I love that for them. Irv Smith Jr. is like sneaky, a pretty good tight end, and him behind Kelsey would be phenomenal. Uh, and then Johnny Smith signed with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, so I guess as there's not really a big tight end that he could take targets away from like he did with Pitts in Atlanta. But we move on to tackle here. 
Michael Wenwu signed with the Pats again, three years, 57 mil. Um, Chukwuma Okorafor, that's always one I struggle with, uh, signed with the Pats as well uh, for one year, four mil. So the Pats are beefing up. Outside of that, tackle been pretty quiet. Um, center, I mean, O-line in general has been pretty quiet outside of the interior, but um, center re-signed Andre James with the Raiders, three years, 24 mil. Lloyd Cush. Jesus. Lloyd Cushenberry signed with the Tennessee Titans four years, 50 mil. I told you it was going to be, a, there's a lot of names here. <laughs> um, and that's about it for relevant center signings. Um, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, I missed one. Aaron Brewer signed with the Dolphins three years, 21 mil. Um, guards, Kevin Dotson re signed with the Rams three years, 48 million. Robert Hunt signed with the Panthers five years, 100 million. A uh, big deal there. Ezra Cleveland re-signed with the Jags. Three years, $28 million. I love that for them. That's a good deal for Ezra Cleveland. I don't know how they got him to take that uh, low of a pay cut, but they did. I know he had kind of a tough season, but overall in his career, has been solid. Uh, Jonah Jackson, uh, Lions, uh, guard for a while. A lot of times hasn't been able to stay on the field, but when he is, he's fantastic. Signed with the Rams, three years, $51 mil. I'm happy he got paid. Speaking of Lions, they got Graham Glasgow, re-signed three years, $20 mil. They signed him to a one-year deal last season as just a backup guard for Big V and Jonah Jackson, and then he ended up having to play a lot of the season with injuries, uh, and he was great for the Lions. He played some center. He played guard for them for uh, most of the season, and three years, 20 mil is great for him. Uh, it looked like there was going to be a point where maybe he retired after this or last season uh, when he signed the one-year deal, but then he goes and gets three more. So he's going to be with the Lions for a while. Love to see that. John Runyon signed with the Giants three years, $30 million. Damian Lewis signed with the Panthers for four years, $53 million. And John Simpson signed with the New York Jets for two years, TBD. Whew. Okay, that's it for all the <laughs> offensive signings. Uh, I kind of have said my piece on the guys I needed to say my piece on, so I can pass it to you, Zach. Well, one of the deals I really enjoyed seeing, and I think it's a really good fit, is Aaron Jones to Minnesota. Uh, he signed for a one-year deal, $7 million, after getting cut from Green Bay after they had just signed Josh Jacobs. Uh, Alexander Madison just wasn't working out. He wasn't turning out to be the RB one that they had hoped after he was backing up Dalvin cook for that really long time. And Aaron Jones, in my opinion, he's a top five, maybe top seven back in the league when he's fully healthy and he can bring some good diversity to their offense as both a pass catcher and running, uh, outside and inside the tackles. And it also helps a rookie quarterback if Minnesota decides to trade up, uh, or just stick and pick at what are they? 12 or 13. I don't remember exactly, but the other uh, contract and fit that I really like is Kirk Cousins to the Falcons. Uh, it's kind of basic, but I don't think, unlike you, Josh, I think it's a solid contract. I think he's gonna uh, he's gonna play into that forty five million a year cap hit. Atlanta was arguably a quarterback away from winning their division and probably a playoff game or two as well. And it finally gives their weapons a chance to really exceed uh, within their roles with an actual competent competent quarterback. So just because bouncing between uh, Desmond Ritter and uh, Taylor Heineke, that's just not going to cut it. Kirk Cousins, he was having an MVP caliber season before he got hurt, and he was doing a, a solid chunk of that without Justin Jefferson as well. So having Kyle Pitts, who you can argue will have a similar role to TJ Hawkinson, who's getting like seven to 10 catches almost every game. Drake London, he's no Justin Jefferson, but he's still the number one receiver for them who will command a lot of targets. Now they have Darnell Mooney, who's really going to, command a lot of targets from the slot. Then they got Algier and Bijan in the backfield and probably a top five, six O line in the league. So I think they, I think that's the exact piece that they needed to really get their offense off the ground with the new regime uh, and offensive scheme as well. I think it's a good move for them. I just yeah, want to now, say about the Kirk Cousins contract, the per year is the problem for me. I just think the four years just got crazy. That's my issue with it is the four years. I agree. I think four years might be a smidge long, strictly because of age, but... He's going to be 40 when that contract ends. Yeah, but I mean, hey, maybe he's still going to be producing at 40 because it's not like he's running around like a Lamar or Justin Fields or Kyler Murray where he needs... His Tours Achilles last season. I mean, he's one of the last quarterbacks I... I mean, I think I said on last episode, he's one of the last quarterbacks where I was really worried about that injury impacting his play because he plays from within the pocket anyways, so I think he'll be okay. We shall see. Yeah, I think it'll be okay, but it'll be interesting to see how that works out for them years down the road. But on to defensive free agency signings. Again, there's a lot of them, just like offense. We'll start with interior defensive line. The main big one, Kansas City Chiefs re-signed Chris Jones, five years, $158 million. 
big to keep your best player. Uh, he helps them win games. He's just as important as Le- he's more important than Legarius Sneed. So we'll see Legarius Sneed probably get traded within the next couple of days. But they get to keep Chris Jones. Justin Matabuke re-signed with the Ravens. They'd initially franchise tagged him, but he will sign a contract for four years, $98 million. Christian Wilkins signs with the Las Vegas Raiders, four years, $110 million. Nice move for the Raiders to help that D-line and go with Max Crosby. Leonard Williams re-signed with the Seahawks, three years, $64 million. Grover Stewart re-signs with the Colts, three years, $39 million. Big for them. Their uh, defensive line struggled against the run with him out. Uh, it's important to keep him. Daquan Jones resigns with the Buffalo Bills, two year, sixteen million. Uh, Javon Kinlaw is going to leave the 49ers for the New York Jets, one year contract. Ashawn Robinson signs with the Carolina Panthers, three years, twenty two and a half million dollars. Uh, their defense was solid last year, so nice to add something after losing Dante Jackson a corner. But Raquan Davis, Indianapolis Colts, two years, fourteen millions. Probably just a rotational player to throw in there when Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner aren't on the field. Bilal Nichols signs with the Arizona Cardinals, three years, $21 million. And that's pretty much it for interior defensive line. On to edge defenders, uh, a lot of big ones at the top. Josh Allen, he was franchise tagged, one year, $24 million. Uh, important to keep him. That is the motor of their defense. Brian Burns was franchise tagged by the Panthers, but has been traded to the New York Giants, who have started to develop a pretty good D-line there now with him on the outside, Kayvon Thibodeau. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out for him defensively. Daniil Hunter today shocks and uh, signs with the Houston Texans two years, $49 million. That's a very, very good sign for the Texans. Uh, it's going to help D'Amico Ryans. That defense is only going to get better. They were pretty solid last year. And now adding an elite pass rusher who just had a career high in sacks is huge. Bryce Huff signs with the Philadelphia Eagles three years, $51 million. That's a nice contract. Very good pass rusher. Jonathan Grenard signs with the Vikings, four years, $76 million. So basically a swap between him and Daniil Hunter there. Zadarius Smith re-signs with the Cleveland Browns, two years, $23.5 million. Nice to keep that partner with Miles Garrett. Leonard Floyd signed with the San Francisco 49ers, two years, $20 million. Just a solid piece to have on the D-line. Danico Autry signs with the Houston Texans, two years, $20 million. Uh, he likes to stay in the AFC South. He was a member of the Colts. Then the Titans, now the Texans, all he's got left is the Jags before he retires. Dorrance Armstrong signs with the Washington Commanders. Three years, $33 million. Nice signing for them. Dan Quinn gets to keep one of his guys from Dallas. He's been doing that a lot recently. Brandon Graham re-signs with the Eagles for one year. AJ Epinesa re-signs with the Bills two years, $12, minute, 12 million. Nice to keep that piece. He was solid for them. Big signing for the Lions. He's dealt with injuries, but Marcus Davenport, one year, $6.5 million. I think that's a great contract for them. Help the D-line, which had its struggles, but this should help improve it. Tyquan Lewis re-signs with the Colts. Two years, $12 million. Nice depth signing. Uh, Eater Gross Mateau signs with the 49ers. Two years, $18 million. So uh, just another rotational piece for the Niners. They already have a great D-line, but we'll see how that goes. Some big ones still out there. Carl Lawson, Calais Campbell, Chase Young, Jadavion Clowney. Uh, but on to linebackers, the big one today, Patrick Queen signs with the Philadelphia <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers, three years, $41 million. Uh, I think that's a great signing for them. Their defense is only going to get better with that. Great linebacker to have. Frankie Louvu from the Panthers signs with the Washington Commanders, three years, $31 million. I think that's also a very good deal. I'm shocked to see the Panthers let him go. He was great for them last season. Like I said earlier, their defense was solid. It was really the offensive struggles that hurt him. Levante Davis stays in Tampa Bay, his home, one-year contract. Jordan Brooks is going to leave Seattle to sign with Miami. Uh, three years, $26 million. Nice signing for them. Aziz Alshire signs with the Houston Texans. Uh, he had been with the 49ers with D'Amico Ryans, and now he's going to go back to D'Amico Ryans. The Texans are making some great moves on the defensive side of the ball. Josie Jewell signs with the Carolina Panthers, three years, $22.5 million. Nice signing. Drew, T- Drew Tw- Tranquil signs with the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, three years, $19 million. Nice to keep him. Jordan Hicks signs with the Cleveland Browns. Two years, $8 million. Uh, Willie Gay from the Chiefs signs with the New Orleans Saints. One-year contract. Anthony Walker uh, signs with the Miami Dolphins for a one-year contract. And Kenneth Murray signs with the Tennessee Titans. Two years, $15.5 million. Still some big ones out there. Shaquille Leonard, Isaiah Simmons, Denzel Perryman, Zach Cunningham, Bobby Wagner, Jerome Baker, Devin White, just to name a few. Um, 
And now to cornerback, uh, the big one we'd already talked about, Jalen Johnson, re-signs with the Bears for a year, $76 million. Legereus Sneed was franchise tagged by the Chiefs. He'll be traded here soon. Jadobi Awuzie signs with the Tennessee Titans, three years. Uh, I'd said last week they needed to help get help in the secondary, and they make a move there to grab a cornerback. Kenny Moore re-signs with the Indianapolis Colts, three years, $30 million. He becomes the highest-paid nickel corner in NFL history. Well-deserved. He's great. I think he's probably worth more than that, but that's just the price they pay for nickel corners. Sean Murphy Bunting signs with the Arizona Cardinals, three years, $25.5 million. Keyshawn Nixon re-signs with Green Bay, three years, $18 million. Emmanuel Mosey, who came back from a torn ACL just to tear his ACL, re-signs with the Lions, one year, $1.125 million. Uh, Jeff Okuda signs with the Houston Texans, another team that's going to try to take a chance on him for one year, $4.75 million. And Dante Jackson was traded to the Steelers. Uh, another trade that happened with cornerback Carlton Davis was traded to the Detroit Lions. Uh, some of the free agents still on the board. Kendall Fuller, Stephon Gilmore, Adoree Jackson, Steven Nelson, uh, Christian Fulton, Rocky Asin. Uh, a couple solid ones out there, but on to safeties. Uh, this is a stacked safety free agency class. We've seen a decent amount of them off the board already. We saw Antoine Winfield get franchise tagged, well-deserved. He was, in my opinion, probably the best safety in the, in the NFL last year with Tampa Bay. One year, the franchise tag is $17 million. Kyle Duggar was franchise tagged by the New England Patriots, one year, $13 million. Xavier McKinney had a great season last year in New York. He signs with Green Bay for four years, $68 million. Geno Stone signs with Cincinnati, two years, $50 million. C.J. Gardner-Johnson is now back in Philadelphia after a little bit of an uh, argument with the fan base while he was in Detroit, but now he's back three years, $33 million. What? I said a little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Darnell Savage signs with Jacksonville for three years. Jeremy Chin has signed with the Commanders. Commanders are making some nice moves on the defensive side of the ball. They need to. Their defense was terrible last season. Jalen Mills to the New York Giants one year. Kevin Byard to the Bears for two years. Brandon Jones to the Broncos three years, $20 million. Taylor Rapp, Buffalo Bills. He re-signs with the Buffalo Bills three years, $10 million. They needed to keep uh, some sort of safety. They've lost their other ones. Some of the big ones still on the board. Cameron Curl is on the board. Julian Blackman, Jordan Fuller, Jordan Whitehead, Deshaun Elliott, Tayshawn Gibson, Mike Edwards. Uh, Eddie Jackson is still on the board. Jordan Poyer did sign with the Miami Dolphins for a one-year deal. And I think that is basically it for defensive free agency. All right. So a couple of the signings that I really uh, think are good fits. Bryce Huff to Philly. Uh, for only three years, $51 million. This gives them a little bit of leeway to trade uh, Josh Sweat or Reddick for picks to kind of give themselves some cap relief and a couple swings and probably day two of the draft. And Huff, he was honestly really good last year. He played alongside Quinn and Williams, who is probably a top three defensive tackle in the league. But he's also going, who's going to, and he's, play with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter, who have been who have shown flashes and are just very talented individuals as a whole. The other move that I really liked was, you know, I can't leave my bears off of this. Uh, Kevin Byard to Chicago for two years for $15 million. You're basically going to get Eddie Jackson level production or better for only half the price. And even on a really, really, really rough Philly uh, pass defense, he made a couple of really nice plays and knock on wood. He hasn't missed a game in his entire career. So one play in particular that I really enjoyed, I've seen it on Twitter a couple times now. I went back and watched the Chiefs game where the Eagles and Chiefs played. Bayard actually picked off Mahomes and kind of baited him a little bit. It was kind of nice. So that gives me a little bit of hope. Uh, Bayard is 31, if I'm not mistaken. So we're only going to have him for two, maybe three or four years uh, if he's performing well, but that's just because of age. And I just, I think Ryan Poles didn't trust uh, the, the, what's it called the rookie class of safeties enough to take a swing on one in day two or early day three. So I trust this judgment. I think this is a solid pickup and I think it can, it, it rounds out a very nice, uh, a nice secondary for Chicago. Yeah. I just wanted to say a couple of things about the lions moves that they made uh, before we move on here. Uh, they did trade for Carlton Davis. I'm indifferent about this trade. I don't love giving up, the Hawkinson pick for him. I'm not going to lie. I don't love that. But I will say 
although his stats were not phenomenal last year, they were solid, and he was the he was the cornerback one for a lot of the season for the Bucks. I think between that trade and signing Marcus Davenport, I think you have just two boomer bust scenarios there. If they could stay on the field, they're going to be productive, and both of them are going to be great for the contracts you have them on, uh, especially Davenport one year, six point five mil. But you have Carlton Davis on an expiring. Worst case scenario, he plays bad. You don't sign him next year, and you lose a third rounder. You gain two six, which is bad, of course, but it could be worse uh, than if you go and. As much as I still want Legarius Sneed, even though they're not going to get him, if you go and you trade a third or a second, even for Sneed, you sign him to a four year deal, and he has a fall off, then you're in a bad contract situation. So I think maybe the Lions wanted to avoid that at all costs. Although I do think that would be a good pickup, and I like the Davenport pickup. I mean. Worst case scenario for him is he doesn't play, you lose 6.5 mil for one year. It's not that big of a deal. Um, they did uh, sign a Meek Robertson today from the Raiders for two years, 9.25 mil. Uh, I like that move a lot. He's very highly praised among uh, the Raiders coaching staff and a lot of guys around the league. Um, so I like that move for them. Another cheap contract, a guy that if he isn't great, it's not going to absolutely kill you. Uh, and he's a scrappy guy who was a part of a Raiders defense that had a really, really good uh, back two thirds of the season. We'll talk about the Raiders here in a bit, but yeah, those are basically the only moves that I haven't talked about. Oh, Jalen Reese Maven as well, uh, All Pro, uh, one of the best uh, special teams players in the league. You signed him for two more years, seven point five mil. So I like that as well. But um, unless you guys have anything else to say about free agency here, I think he's the new right. NFLPA president or something. Yeah, I did see that as well. I don't know if he's really? the president or like just part of the board or I don't know, but. He's in there. He's, he's up there. That's crazy. He's making, he's making some moves up there. But um, All right, then. We can move on here to the AFC and NFC West recaps. Starting with the Los Angeles Chargers, they were 10-7 and 7 in 2023, and this year they were 5-12. and 12. Uh, A really a brutal season for them. They always are going to have high expectations. They have so many star players on their team. They spend so much money. Uh, you have one of the better quarterbacks in the league in Herbert, but you lose Herbert, which – of course, is going to take the season for them. But they were under 500 before that, and they weren't playing any defense whatsoever. So they were already in a bad spot before that. They fired Brandon Staley, which is good that you got him out of there when you could. And then you go and you hire Jim Harbaugh, which I think is a great hire. I think he can really turn around the culture there, a culture that needs a turnaround in the Chargers. Uh, maybe you can start rallying some fans in if you start getting good, and then there you go. You should, you're starting to build something there in L.A. Uh, once again, for the Chargers, though, just – an underperforming season with a lot of great players, a lot of players that you're going to lose this year now, especially with Khalil Mack uh, and then possibly one of your receivers. But the Chargers, I think they just have to have a decent offseason in the draft. But overall, I think they're going to be okay. I think getting Jim Harbaugh was the biggest thing they could have possibly done. If we're looking at the Chargers now and they have, I don't even know, um, I'm trying to think of a coach that would be very underwhelming for them. Um, who did the, what's the name of the Mike Titans McDonald's? Guy? No, McDonald's like, I like. What's what's the Titans new? Brian Callahan? Name? Callahan. I think if you go and you get Callahan instead of Harbaugh, I think you're looking at this a little bit different. But you get a big name in Harbaugh, a guy that's done it before, been to a Super Bowl, uh, just won a national championship. I think you have, you're you looking up, and then you're obviously going to have Justin Herbert next season. So they're going to be okay, but a really brutal season for Chargers fans overall. Yeah, I completely agree. The talent on the roster really didn't show up at all in the way we all thought it would. The three of us were making fun of them all year, especially when we were picking the games. Just can you trust them? But you really couldn't for a majority of the year. Eckler, he was pretty bad. Keenan Allen, he had a career year on with uh, over 1,200 yards and 108 catches. For those of you that had him on the, uh, your fantasy team, he was dominating for you there as well. Justin Herbert was good, but he hurt for I think the last four games of the year Khalil Mack on the defensive side he had his best sack total year since 2015 and a career high with 17 and a half so that was really impressive and Joey Bosa it feels like he's been in this uh boat for the last couple years he just can't stay healthy but like you mentioned Josh with Bosa and Mack uh, very interested to see if they kind of just dangle him out there as trade bait or come out right in a couple months so a team that needs an edge rusher wink wink nudge nudge Chicago I mean maybe go get a guy that I think a jersey swap wouldn't be too difficult in Khalil Mack. So he could give you a little bit of juice on a defense that's uh, bookended by Jalen Johnson, uh, Tremaine Edmonds, TJ Edwards, and Montez Sweat. I'm getting away from the point here. But the there's they got to find a way to keep around Justin Herbert or else they're just going to waste his prime. I think adding Jim Harbaugh, that was huge. Uh, just 
compared to anybody else on the market, I think he was probably a really good fit for Justin Herbert. I think he's going to get a really solid team around him and just utilize the weapons to their fullest extent. Yeah, uh, not the season you wanted at all if you're the Chargers. Um, part of it was their own issues with their culture. Brandon Staley was just not a good coach. Injuries hurt him as well. Mike Williams tore his ACL pretty early in the season. He was off to a nice start. And after that, the offense wasn't as good without him. Uh, obviously, the big injury with Justin Herbert and his finger in Week 14. Uh, but by that point, the team was already pretty dead. It just made them worse with Easton Stick, only 16 points per game when he was behind center. Uh, Austin Eckler was not the same this year as he had been in prior years. His age seems to have finally caught up to him, looked slower. He dropped his output in basically every statistical category. Uh, went from 13 rushing touchdowns last season to only five this season. Quentin Johnson was not great for him this year. Uh, he struggled uh, getting open a little bit, but mainly the most important part was drops. Just way too many drops as a first-round receiver that you can't have, and it didn't help that the receivers picked after him had looked pretty good for most of the time. Uh, they're not in a great salary cap position, so they're going to have to figure that out, but luckily for them, they have Justin Herbert. He's one of the best young quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, they just have to worry about getting out some of that regressing aging talent and getting in some younger guys to help this offense. Uh, their defense was not good either. They were getting bullied a lot in the trenches, especially. Cleo Mack was great, like you guys said, uh, but he's getting older and a big cap hit. I would kind of think they're going to move on from him, but we'll see what they do. Uh, they need to focus on helping that interior D-line and stopping the run a little bit. But with Herbert at quarterback, uh, and but not Harbaugh at coach, I think this team will always be dangerous. It'll be interesting to see what they do in the offseason. They're going to need to get a running back. Maybe Harbaugh goes and gets his guy, Blake Corum. But uh, with Herbert, you should still have a future. Yep. Moving on here to the Denver Broncos. They were 5-12 and in 2023, 8-9 and in 2024. Uh, they started off the season 1-5, and five and all hope was kind of lost. But they figured out a way. Uh, to get it all together, and they went on a big win streak. They got all the way up to seven and six from one and five. Uh, so that six and one stretch was obviously very huge for them, and just building everything together because everything was looking like, oh, we just traded for Sean Payton essentially, and then uh, we got Russ. And I mean, we as we know, the Russ situation isn't going to work out for them. But regardless, uh, you got the Sean Payton thing figured out, and he's going to remain at head coach. Thank God that didn't for him turn out into a complete dumpster fire. Uh, the defense for the Broncos was really bad early on. They were just giving up a ton of points, but they ended up being okay towards the end of the season. They were getting stops. Their offense never really got it fully together, but their defense did. Uh, they had some uh, some fines and some suspensions uh, for <laughs> some illegal hits in the secondary, but their defense was uh, gritty, to say the least. Uh, they did end up getting rid of Russ, like I alluded to, and they're going to start fresh at quarterback. It's interesting to me what they're going to do. Uh, at quarterback overall, do you go and you draft a guy? Do you go and trade for Justin Fields? That's one spot that I don't really see people talking about uh, for Fields is Denver. I, like, I don't know why Denver wouldn't be a spot. They have nobody. Like, they just got crazy. rid of Russ. The fit's not there. What Sean Payton uh, wants from a quarterback, Justin Fields I agree. do. I agree, but at, at the end of the day, like if the Bears are going to trade him for like – if it gets bad enough where he goes for like a sixth or a seventh, then like why not at that point? But – uh, don't get especially if you don't, don't have a quarterback. Yeah, that's what I like. I just don't see why you wouldn't do that. Uh, and I think the value could go that low for the Bears, especially if the Seahawks go and get somebody now, or or if they make it apparent they're going to draft somebody trade up maybe. But uh, we'll see. I, back to the Broncos, though. I believe in Sean Payton and what this team was uh, towards the middle of the season. I think they were really good. I think they can be really good. They just have to answer that quarterback question, and they have a decent amount of talent overall. We did. Did we talk about the Jerry Judy trade? I don't, I don't think know if we, we did. did. They, I don't think we did. They they did trade Jerry Judy, um. But yeah, I think the Broncos have enough talent around them. I think if they get a quarterback, and then Sean Payton's still one of the better coaches in the league, in my opinion, and I think he'll be able to figure it out for them in my eye. Yeah, he's definitely up there. But even though the record doesn't look that bad, I don't think this team really took this year. Russ was all he's gone now. Javante Williams had a couple bright spots, but he was really inconsistent all year, especially as a receiver. But when uh, Corton Sutton is going to have a monster highlight reel from this year because of all those amazing catches. So that's really the the brightest spot from their offense. Uh, Justin Simmons and Pat Sertan were great, but only one of them is on the roster due to kind of just 
uh, salary cap issues. And honestly, it just looks like they're going to tank next year. So that's going to be what 2024 is going to be like for them. I don't expect anything crazy for them for a little bit. Uh, I'm expecting anywhere between like four, three to six wins, probably. Maybe I'm a little low on that. Maybe I'm underestimating Sean Payton, but I just don't see them winning a ton of games. I expect them to be in the hunt for a quarterback in 2025. I mean, it, this team's not too exciting to look at. Uh, I think they, geez, they did. I don't remember, but this is a, this is a rough situation to be in. Yeah. Uh, just a rough situation to be in. They're paying Russell Wilson a lot of money to play for the Steelers. Uh, I don't really want to talk about, well, you have to, but that situation as a whole is just so weird to me. Uh, they started the season one and five. It was a rough start. Did not look good at all. They lost 70 to 20 against the Dolphins. The team looked dead. Uh, Garrett Bowles said he was tired of losing, and that's, that's all he had done in his time in Denver. The team was just not in a good spot, but then they won five games in a row against some pretty good teams, four playoff teams. They beat the Packers, Chiefs, Bills, Vikings, and Browns. Their defense started to get better. Uh, Russell Wilson was playing some decent football, not turning the ball over. They were just finding ways to win games. Then they had a couple games where they just lost and really just couldn't overcome the bad start that they had. Uh, and then they decided to move on from Russell Wilson and bench him for Jared Stidham, which I, st- I still don't understand. You're paying Russell Wilson so much money and you give up on him basically a year and a quarter. Uh, they tried every possible way to save money and cut him. The, uh, in the NFLPA statement on their investigation, they said that the Broncos informed Mr. Wilson and his agent that if Mr. Wilson did not renegotiate his contract to relinquish certain salary guarantees, the Broncos would remove him from the starting lineup. That it's just absurd. I don't understand it at all. I saw someone saying that Sean Payton was always yelling at him to try to get Russell Wilson to lash out back at him so that they could uh, save money there somehow. Uh, I don't know, but uh, just a wild scenario to trade for a guy and give up on him that fast. Uh, they had a few positives, like Zach said. Cortland Sutton looked great. Career high 10 touchdowns. Marvin Mims was pretty good as a rookie. He was very good on special teams. Uh, but the disappointing guy in that room, like you guys had said, he got traded to the Browns, Jerry Judy. Uh, I'm shocked that his career has kind of went how it is. I was expecting him to be a stud coming out of college. He was great at Alabama for a second there. I remember there being a possibility way before the season started and his last year in college that he could be the first overall pick. Uh, and now his season has kind of just gone downhill, his career. Uh, 54 catches, 758 yards and two touchdowns. He's still a solid receiver, just not that wide receiver one. I was kind of expecting out of him. Uh, I don't know what direction this team is headed. Maybe they're a team that's in like the J.J. McCarthy kind of area. Michael Penix, I don't know. But they really have no stability at quarterback. They're paying Russell Wilson $30 million to play for the Steelers. So uh, n- no clue how they're going to navigate this. Yeah, tough situation for them. But uh, moving on here to the o- the Las Vegas Raiders. In 2023, the Raiders were 6-11. In 2024, they were 8-9. and nine. Uh, The biggest thing for them was just getting the bad man, Josh McDaniels, out of town, getting that guy as far away from your organization as you can. Uh, it was just a bad culture fit for them, bad culture fit for anybody, I would assume. And then you get AP in there who everybody loved him. They're dominant around with uh, interim head coaches. They really rally around those guys uh, in Vegas. The Raiders' defense, like I said earlier in this pod, they were really phenomenal for most of the season, especially the back couple thirds. Uh, they were fantastic. They were really keeping this team in games, getting them wins. Got them all the way to uh, eight and nine, uh, which is not a great record. But when you have uh, a lot of holes around your team, it is a good record. They went and they beat Mahomes um, in Arrowhead as well, uh, which is a big win for them. This team struggled to score at times. Uh, when you have AOC in there, who I do love AOC, but um, the offense as a whole, outside of Devontae Adams and uh, Josh Jacobs, who they no longer have, uh, is pretty. How do I put it? Bland, lackluster. not a good O line. Yeah, lackluster. Don't have many great targets after Adams and Jacobs, and their O line is not great. If they had a solid starting QB all season, though, and no McDaniel's, I think they could have been a playoff team. Their defense was that good towards the end of the year. Um, I think they got to draft somebody or go for Fields next season. Even though I don't think they are going to get Fields, I don't know yet. Um, but you got to probably draft somebody then. Uh, but yeah, I love that they kept AP. That was the best move of their offseason so far. And uh, I think the Raiders have a decently bright future if they can figure out the quarterback situation. Uh, breaking news from Ian Rappaport 
kind of related to the Raiders. Austin Hooper oh, wow. signing a he's signing a one year deal with the Patriots for four point two five million. So kind of just interesting segue. But cool. yeah, I mean, I don't think Justin Fields is going to the Raiders just because if you're hiring Luke Getze as an offensive coordinator, especially right, as yeah, as I forgot did, about him. You're banking on the fact that Fields was the issue in Chicago and vice versa. You don't trade for Fields and then go get Getze because you're banking on Fields uh, really just trying to make the most out of a shitty offensive coordinator situation. But back to the 2023 season for the Raiders. They had a mid-year coaching fire, which actually helped them. Antonio Pierce, like you mentioned, Josh, he seems to have the support of the locker room and then some. The only true bright spot that I really saw on their offense from this year was Devontae Adams. His production was sometimes rough because of the inconsistent target. That was because of the inconsistent quarterback play. Josh Jacobs, it felt like he took a massive step backwards compared to the his 2020 season, which is, I believe, a key reason as to why the Raiders let him walk this year. And Max Crosby, he had a phenomenal year. He had a defensive player of the year type of year. And adding uh, Wilkins to that defensive line will only make the defense better. I think they have a lot to build off of. They've got a lot of studs on both sides of the ball. Next year might be a little bit of a quiet year because they're going to be, one, figuring out back position probably filling out uh receiver spots and tight end spots because they have a what's his name uh jacoby myers and Devonte adams at the top and then not really much after that but defensively as long as you have wilkins and crosby healthy i think they're going to be a unit to be fearful of honestly yeah uh very disappointing start to this season uh josh mcdaniels just didn't bring a good vibe to this team at all didn't have this team really wanting to play football it seemed more like a job than well, it is a job, but it seems straight like a job, not like you're out there going and just playing a game. They were three and five and they decided to fire him, and that was the best move they could have made. Uh, they finally decided to let him go. They were able to have some fun on the football field. They moved on from Jimmy G, who had his struggles early in the season. Uh, Josh McDaniels really doesn't know how to coach NFL players, I guess. Antonio Pierce steps in. Uh, he did a great job as interim head coach. Aiden O'Connell looked okay, good enough to get wins. They were finding ways to win games. Pierce finished with a five and four record. They were able to finish eight and nine, just missed the playoffs. But Antonio Pierce coached himself into another chance this season. Max Crosby, his best player. Max Crosby loves AP. He was phenomenal all season, continues to be one of the best edge rushers in the NFL. Robert Spillane was great at linebacker for them. Led him in tackles, finished with 148 tackles, second most in franchise history. And offensively, even with AOC at QB, Jacoby Myers was still able to look pretty good. Devontae Adams was solid. Devontae, not his best season, but 1,114 receiving yards, eight touchdowns, 103 receptions. Uh, pretty good. I was hoping to see more of Michael Meyer. Uh, not too much of him, but hopefully he can take a step forward next season with whoever they decide to go with at quarterback, which is really the whole uh, kind of their big offseason move is what they'll do at quarterback. They did sign Pro Bowl quarterback Gardner Minshew to a two-year deal, so it'll be interesting to see if he's the starter or if they'll stick with AOC or a Maybe they go for a rookie. Um, but, yeah, uh, Antonio Pierce came in, saved this team, and uh, now they have a semi-bright future instead of just in that dark hole with Josh McDaniels. Yep, finishing off the AFC West here with the Kansas City Chiefs in 2023. They were 14-3 and and won the Super Bowl. In 2024, they were 11-6 and and won the Super Bowl. Um, I mean, what is there to say? It's the, it's the yeah. Chiefs. Um, this is the best defense in the Mahomes era. Giving him a great defense is just kind of a cheat code. It's going to be really, really hard to beat a uh, Patrick Mahomes-led team with a good defense uh, for his entire career. Uh, they did struggle to their standards in the regular season, but as a, the same as the Patriots dynasty, the regular season struggles just don't matter because you know at the end of the day, Mahomes is going to be better than the coach on the other – or sorry, the quarterback on the other side of him. Andy Reid's going to be better than the coach on the other side of him in the playoffs, and there's really just nothing you can do about that. I'd – I don't want to say you have to get lucky, but you almost have to get lucky against them. Uh, none of that really ma- matters because you just have two of the best uh, players in the league, especially with Kelsey, who isn't retiring now, uh, which is good for them big time. But at the same time, as great as Travis Kelsey is, as much as I respect him, I I think if you go and you put – trying to think of who would be a – like if you put like Laporta on that team, I still think they're great if you put – uh, who's a, a worse tight end than, than Laporta? That's uh, Kyle Pitts. I think if you put Kyle Pitts on the Chiefs, I think they're still Let's, as good. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's it's Mahomes, dude. No, it's no, no, no. I, I'm talking worse tight end than Laporta. Let's slow down on the Kyle Pitts hate here. 
Kyle Pitts is a worse tight end than Laporta. I think that's. I don't think that's a hot. Yeah, take. I'm taking Laporta. Yeah, I mean, just so t- Laporta had a better. Well, I just don't like how Kyle you said it so easily. Coach. I mean, he is. I mean, he's not that <sighs> much worse than Laporta. He's still top ten, but like Laporta had a better season this year than Pitts has ever had. But regardless, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but anyways, I think you can, as important as some of these players are, we saw the same thing with Tyreek Hill. You can plug and play another receiver, and it's still Patrick Mahomes. It's still Andy Reid. They're still going to be able to go out there and win. So I think as much as they were, everyone in the Chiefs organization was dreading a, a Kelsey retirement, I still think they would recover from that well, and they would be able to continue the dynasty. Uh, Chris Jones was the biggest question mark going into this season. They signed him by week two, uh, extended him uh, the other day. but. I, I know that Clark Hunt is one of the most hated owners in the NFL, even by his own uh, team. Oh, but right, because of the survey, yeah, dead last. But um, that's what good organiz- organizations do. They don't drag things out. You get to week two, you get the deal done, you get him back on the field, uh, and that's what they had to do. And then you sign him to an extension pretty quickly in the offseason. So at the end of the day, I mean, what are we going to do? Critique of a team that just won back to back Super Bowls and it's a hell of a chance to go get three in a row, but. Uh, Good season for the Chiefs, I guess. Sorry, I'm watching. I think Bedard just netted one, but uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard to critique the back to back champs. They're shooting for three in a row next year. Mahomes was Mahomes, but Chico had a really solid sophomore year. Rasheed Rice was kind of a surprise to the offense. He won over wide receiver one within that group, and he, I think, he gained Mahomes trust this year. Mahomes and Kelsey wasn't the best that we have ever seen they've been at, but they were still very good. But Josh, like you said, uh just a few minutes before and probably a couple months ago that towards the end of the regular season, Kansas city's offense was very iffy the entire year, but in the postseason, Reed and Mahomes, they buckled down. They play great when it matters the most in the playoffs and eventually the Super Bowl. Chris Jones, he very much earned that extension that he just got and continues to show why he is one of the best defensive players on the planet. And Trent McDuffie and Legereus Sneed were great in that second year and really anchored that, that young defense. So they, they've got some, as crazy as it sounds, they've got some pieces they can build around. They got veterans who were uh, solidified for five plus years. And you've got Travis Kelsey, who may have a little bit of a off the field distraction with all these concerts he's going to out of the country. But when it all matters, he's going to show up. He's going to give you five catches for a hundred yards and probably a touchdown in those most important games of the year. And Mahomes, he's going to be Mahomes. So it, he can't critique this team. They are a dynasty. There will probably be a dynasty until Mahomes retires. And it's just, it sucks to see during our lifetimes, uh, especially for you, Mike, because you're in the same conference. At least Josh and I don't have to worry about seeding against Mahomes year in and year out. But if one of us makes it to the Super Bowl, it's more more likely than not that Mahomes is going to be waiting for us on the other side. Yeah. Then this is the second dynasty in my lifetime now in the AFC. Uh, but uh, after a kind of a down regular season for the Chiefs where their offense didn't look as good as it had in prior season, they had their struggles. Kelsey had a struggle, especially late in the season. They really didn't see much of the ball. Uh, I don't know where the team just figures it out right in just in time for the playoffs. They go on a Super Bowl run and win a Super Bowl, and uh, they're now a modern, modern-day dynasty. Uh, they're led by the best quarterback in the league, uh, Patrick Mahomes, obviously. Uh, but really, it was part of... Part of this was really the elite defense led by Steve Spagnuolo. Uh, one of the best defenses in the league, if not the best defense. Uh, consistently one of the top units all season. Like you said, Chris Jones had been phenomenal. Uh, Nick Bolton had been phenomenal. Legereus Sneed and Trent McDuffie are just two phenomenal corners. Luckily for the NFL, one of them, Legereus Sneed, will hopefully be off their team next season. Uh, but the offense didn't look great, and then the playoffs, they figure it out. Mahomes... In the regular season, still finished with over 4,000 passing yards. Did have 14 interceptions, which didn't feel great for Patrick Mahomes. They didn't have a 1,000-yard receiver all season, but in the playoffs, they figured it out. Kelsey was phenomenal. Rashi Rice was phenomenal. Um, he emerged late, towards late in the season, finished with 938 yards. Kelsey finished uh, with only 984 receiving yards. He didn't get to 1,000 yards for the first time in a pretty long time. Uh, but they go to the playoffs, and they had definitely their toughest route to the Super Bowl, having to play in the freezing cold against Miami, had to go to Buffalo, had to go to Baltimore, and then had to play the elite 49ers team in the Super Bowl, and they were able to run the table and beat all those teams. Uh, Kelsey Mullins were phenomenal. Pacheco was also phenomenal for them for most of the season. 
Uh, it's unfortunate that this team is not going to go anywhere soon. We saw Mahomes restructure his contract today to save him twenty million this season. Um, really, not much you can say. They're just they're a dynasty. Yep. Um, what are you going to say about the, the Chiefs? I mean, I can't even think of one criticism at this point. But yeah. um, moving on to the NFC West, starting out with the Arizona Cardinals, they were 4-13 in 2023, 4-13 in 2024. Overall, uh, kind of a successful bad season, uh, to, to put it that way, for the Cardinals. Kyler recovered really well. You confirmed that he's the guy. There were question marks going into the season. Do they try to tank and get Caleb Williams and trade Kyler? I've always been a big Kyler guy. I, as much as I really, really like Caleb Williams, it's not. It's a situation where if I'm, I don't know, because the extension. But if I'm the Cardinals and I had the first overall pick, I think I probably trade it and I'd just try to get whatever I can out of it. Trade down to like five and rock with Kyler, just because Kyler's a really, really good quarterback. And honestly, I think he's in one of the most underrated players in the NFL right now. Um, they're going to end up getting Marvin Harrison most likely, which. That was another thing that a lot of people were saying earlier in the season. Maybe the Cardinals get the first pick, keep Kyler, and uh, draft Marvin Harrison. Now, like it, as it always does when we have a, a tackle or a receiver projected to go high in the draft earlier in the season, quarterbacks emerge, teams need quarterbacks. It's always going to be quarterbacks at the top. And Marvin Harrison, who could be the number one pick if quarterback didn't exist as a position, is now going to fall to four, and they're most likely going to get him there. Gannon, he's an okay head coach. Um, he started out really low with all the pew pews. Everybody was all uh, explosives. Everybody was all upset about that, but he turned out to be an okay head coach. Yeah. Um, Paris Johnson, solid season. There were some question marks early with him. Ended up having a solid season overall. We won't really know with this team what the state of this team is until we get a full Kyler gain in season uh, because you really just can't judge them otherwise. So I don't want to give any like, oh, this team's in a great spot. They're in a bad spot. I don't think we really know what spot they're in. We'll know at the end of the next season, but for now, I think they had a successful bad season. I completely agree. Surprisingly enough, this team was in quite a few games that they probably shouldn't have been in. Uh, don't forget, they even beat the Cowboys in the early part of the year. Kyler was pretty solid when he came back. He was shaking off the rust for the most part. Uh, Josh Dobbs, well, he was fun for a little while while that little magical run was happening. They desperately need a wide receiver one because Hollywood Brown definitely wasn't cutting it, and he's a free agent. So luckily, they'll have a chance at Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, at pick number four, but if all hell breaks loose, either Washington or the Patriots decide to go uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. with their pick, they'll have a nice consolation prize with Mavers, who I think is not far off from being wide receiver one. If it wasn't, if it was anybody but Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors would be receiver one. So regardless of what happens, they're walking away with an alpha receiver in this draft. Trey McBride, his emergence was really clutch and gives Kyler a weapon for next year and beyond. The defense needs a little bit of work. Nobody really jumped out at me when watching them play, but Gannon was a pretty solid coach. And even after that cringe introduction, uh, they're trending in the right direction. And like you mentioned, Josh, we're going to get a clear picture of this team after we see Kyler with an entire off season of getting used to the system, getting used to the new weapons, all that good stuff that a uh, relative young quarterback can use. Because Kyler's not perfect. It's going to take some time to get off of Call of Duty and then jump back into the practice vest and all that stuff. But I'm very intrigued to see where the Cardinals go because quarterback changes everything. And I agree with you, Josh. Kyler is a severely underrated one. He's probably in my top 10, top nine. Uh, it's just recency bias of when he was playing. He wasn't stacking wins, but that's not his fault. The roster was very depleted. So next year could be a very interesting one for the Cardinals if they stack talent in this draft. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I think this was kind of a successful, uh, just bad season. Finished four and thirteen, uh, but you had a lot of positives with Kyler Murray. Gannon looked like he was starting to develop a good culture. Three of their four wins came against playoff teams. Kyler Murray looked pretty solid coming off of a torn ACL. His mobility didn't look like it really had taken that much of a hit. Uh, they never really came to a game and looked like they were just getting ran over. Um, they didn't. They played hard for a team that only had four wins. The defense had its moments where it looked good, but it really just lacks talent on that side of the ball. They have a lot of work to do on the defensive side. Buda Baker was really disappointing. Uh, Kaiser White was nice this season, but just uh, a lot of work to do over there. Offensively, though, they had a lot of positives. James Conner was very good for them. Finished with over 1,000 rushing yards, seven rushing touchdowns. Trey McBride, like you guys said, when Kyler Murray came back, he was very good. He led the team in receiving yards with 825 uh, with um, 
Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown out from a decent amount. Uh, Kyler didn't really have a wide receiver one to throw to. Uh, and so I, that's why I'm with you guys. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. on this team would be scary. And I'm very excited. I hope that happens. That's my dream scenario for the Cardinals. Paris Johnson Jr., the rookie tackle, he looked very promising out there. That was a good thing for them. He played all 1,065 snaps this season, was very vital to helping James Conner in the running game. They have only four wins, but uh, you still have that second first-round pick this season. You have your own. You can stack talent with Marvin Harrison at wide receiver, and maybe with that second pick, you try to get someone defensively to help you there. So nice season for them, considering they only had four wins. Now, off topic here, but speaking of the Cardinals, the Louisville Cardinals just fired head coach no. after two very, very, very bad seasons. Wow. Hopefully he will come back to Poppy Calipari and uh, join the Kentucky bench once again. But that was a very unsuccessful stint. Yeah. Did you uh, see the, the Cardinals? Did you see the Louisville fan at their game today? No. He started a keep Kenny Payne chant. One fan, he started to keep Kenny Payne chant, and he was trying to get people to join into him, and everyone just started booing him. That's crazy. (laughs) Rough go for Kenny Payne. Very rare you see see a keep insert coach chant ever. But, yeah, uh, unfortunate for little brother there. But moving on here to the Seattle Seahawks. 2023, 9-8, lost in the wild card round. 2024, 9-8, did not make the playoffs. Um, they're still stuck in this post Russell Wilson middle ground, uh, post Legion of Boom middle ground. Um, Geno Smith is an okay quarterback when he has time, but he's not always going to have time. That's just not how the NFL works. And I don't know if he can be a difference maker at any point, uh, this this far into his career. But he is still a proper game manager. I think he can be a quarterback if you're not a super serious playoff team and you don't have a ton of talent around you. I think he can be a guy that he can go usher you out and get you some wins. But for the Seahawks, you're an organization that has had a lot of success in recent years. And if you want to continue to be successful, especially with a lot of the guys that you have on your roster, I just don't think that's the route you want to go. They have an okay defense. They hit on picks such as Devin Witherspoon, who was great this season. I think the defense has potential. A lot of young guys on that defense. We'll see if they get Bobby Wagner back this year, but um, their defense was solid this year. They fired Pete Carroll after the season, fired slash parted ways. Uh, that was, oh, yeah, Louisville was parted ways with Kenny Payne. Okay. But um, parted ways with Pete Carroll uh, after the season. Uh, sucks to see his career kind of come to an end, but apparently he's going to stay in the front office for them. They hired Mike McDonald as head coach. I like that hire. He had a lot of success in Baltimore this season. Um, I think that's going to be a good hire for them, especially with a, a lot of the – I mean, there was a good amount of solid head coaching options, but there were some uh, teams that had to settle. They didn't have to settle. Um, I think they just need to move on to QB. Uh, with Geno Smith in there. I think you go draft somebody or maybe go make a trade for somebody out there. But regardless, the Seahawks are in this middle purgatory ground, and I'm not sure where they go from here because they do have talent, but you can waste talent. Yeah, this is a team that I would look out for for Justin Fields, especially yes. if they're looking to move on, you know, because it just makes sense uh, to me. But we're going to better season. I remember, I think it was the Saints in the last episode where I said that their season was in that few negative side of like, uh, what what's the word I'm looking for? A very optimistic view of it. I feel like optimistic. I'm going to say this year. It was a solid year from this group. Gene was fine. He showed a ash at parts. DK was fine. Lockett was good in spurts. Jackson Smith and Jigwa was good when he got the ball, but it's really hard to feed all the talent within that wide receiver room all at once, especially when you have K9, Zach Charbonnet out of the backfield as well. Wagner was a tackle machine, but that's not really anything new. He's just getting older. And they did cut Diggs and uh, Adams as their safety, so they're going to have to find a couple new ones this offseason. This division is going to be really hard to predict, in my opinion, next year in terms of uh, the top three because you're going to have the Niners, who are probably going to regress a slight little bit just because of cap constraints, and Ayuk might be on his way out. I'll get to that in a little bit. The Rams, I'll get a little bit as well, but they they definitely exceeded my expectations for this year. And Seattle, I mean, if Geno has another solid year, then – Maybe they go nine and eight, 10 and seven, and they find themselves in a wild card spot. This division is pretty, it's pretty good overall. So it's going to be a, a 
way to see how they handle this offseason. Yeah, disappointing. They had a pretty solid start. Uh, they were expecting to make the playoffs. That, unfortunately for them, did not happen. Geno Smith looked decent again like he had the year prior. Did have some injuries that he dealt with that hurt him later in the season. Like you said, Zach Bobby Wagner was great, led the NFL in tackles, ties the franchise record. That's just what he does. It was nice for them to see their first-round pick, Devin Witherspoon, was very good in his first season. Uh, showed that he's worth that fifth overall pick. Some teams thought he might have reached for him, but he was phenomenal. Uh, this team has so much talent in a lot of areas. Three great receivers. Uh, they have a couple young tackles. Their running back room has two very good running backs. Uh, they had Bobby Wagner, but uh, really they just need better pass rush. They need now to redo their safeties. Uh, Kobe Parkinson, they re-signed him at tight end. Boye Mafe was great for them. He had nine sacks. Uh, still need more pass rush. Leonard Williams, they were able to re-sign him after the trade during the season. I think it was smart for them to part ways with Pete Carroll. He had been there for so long. He is getting older. And now you bring in a young, defensive-minded head coach, Mike McDonald, uh, to possibly bring some new innovation to this defense. Their offensive coordinator is former Wa- – they their new offensive coordinator is former Washington offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb. Uh, I like that move. I think it could be interesting to see if they don't decide to go for Fields or someone else in the draft, go with Michael Penix, reunite him with his – college offensive coordinator and see how that goes with Geno Smith possibly mentoring him. He is kind of an older uh, prospect, but that could be something to watch him stay in Washington. So uh, overall, you wanted to make the playoffs, but you really kind of have a limit with uh, Geno Smith at quarterback. Yep, moving on here to the LA Rams. They were five and twelve in twenty twenty three with the Stafford injury and the cup injuries in twenty twenty four. They were ten and seven, lost in the wild card round. Significantly overperformed this season. We were all low on them going into the season. Uh, Puka came out of nowhere. That's just unpredictable. Now they have two of the top wide receivers in the league. Uh, great targets for a guy like Matt Stafford. He's going to thrive in a situation like that. Their O line overperformed as well, gave Stafford a ton of time, uh, not making him having to do too much this season, even though he did have an injury at some point. Um, the offense was just back into full top form. Uh, when you can score enough points, you're just going to be in a good spot in this league. The defense really overperformed. Guys like Byron Young, young guys were just great for them. And then, of course, you have Aaron Donald, who's <laughs> going to go out there and do it for you every single time. But when you have such a good head coach and enough talent on offense, you're all, they're always going to be good with this core of Stafford, Cup. Donald Puka now. Uh, so, yeah, I just – if they can keep those guys healthy, they're always going to be in it, and they're always going to be dangerous to make a run in the playoffs. So, I like the Rams. I like them too. I think they massively exceeded my own personal expectations I had for them this year. Stafford was pretty good. Kyron Williams was great when he came back from his uh, beginning of the year injury. Cup wasn't near his 2021 self, but he wasn't bad either. Puka was possibly the steal of the 2023 draft and could have won Offensive Rookie of the Year. He broke two records for rookie receiving as well. Aaron Donald was good as always. Kobe Turner was great for a rookie, and he was a Defensive Rookie of the Year finalist uh, at the end of the year. And Honestly, I think this team can definitely contend in 2024 with the solid free agency uh, group and a couple home runs in the draft. Because you could find a guy like Puka in the fifth, third, fourth round, whatever. You could find a defensive Puka who's going to come off the edge opposite of Byron Young and team up with Kobe Turner and Aaron Donald. And just you can get crazy pressure with those four. But I think they might go edge rusher with, I think they're at pick 20, but they can, they're definitely uh, shooting upwards in terms of trajectory. Yeah, this was something I was really unexpected. Uh, one of the teams that I wasn't expecting to do that good, the Rams. Uh, they had a season far better than I expected, like I said. Uh, they suffered from a loss in the wild card round of the Lions. Uh, but Matt Stafford, coming back off some injuries, was able to play most of the season. He looked pretty good. Finished with 3,965 yards, 24 touchdowns, 11 picks. They were able to find a gem in Puka Nakua, who had one of the best rookie wide receiver seasons of all time. Cooper Cup was in and out of the lineup, finished with 737 yards and five touchdowns. This offense has a lot of weapons. Kyron Williams, uh, they found him last year in the 2022 draft. He missed most of his rookie season with a high ankle sprain. Uh, but with Cam Akers cut early in the season, uh, he showed out, finished with 1,144 rushing yards, seven touchdowns. Their offensive line was far better than we could have expected from them. They played pretty solid. And defensively, um, they kind of just held their own. Uh, great third-year linebacker, Ernest Jones. He had a great season, 145 tackles. He led the team. 
Jordan Fuller was very nice for them at safety. Akello Witherspoon was their leading cornerback. He was phenomenal. 14 pass deflections. He had three interceptions. And obviously they have one of the best defensive players of our generation. Aaron Donald was phenomenal. And he was able to help Kobe Turner uh, lead the team in sacks with nine. So it's interesting to see a team with their top two sack uh, leaders is as two defensive tackles. And that's how it was for the Rams. Aaron Donald finished with eight. But uh, this season was far better than I expected. Uh, but I should have never doubted Matt Stafford, Aaron Donald, and one of the best head coaches, Sean McVay. Yes, and finishing off with our last team here, the 49ers. They were 13-4 and four in 2023, lost in the conference championship. 2024, they were 12-5, and five, lost in the Super Bowl to the Kansas City Chiefs. They dominated on both ends for most of the season. The only bad stretch they had is when they were missing CMC, Debo, and Trent Williams. Uh, for two or three games there, they went on a tough stretch. But after that, before and after, they were great. Brock Purdy, you now know, is the guy. There may be some question marks, especially with the injury last season. But he comes out, has an MVP caliber season. He can be the guy for them as long as they have a very strong core around him like he does right now. Shanahan, sadly, choked again. Uh, but what are you going to do? I mean, he's still one of the best coaches in the league, even if he – continues to have dominant regular seasons, keeps getting to the Super Bowl or the conference championship and keeps losing. I mean, what, are you going to fire him? You can't fire him. Like, it's Kyle Shanahan. You know he's one of the best, smartest head coaches in the league. That's just something you're going to have to deal with and just hope that he eventually breaks through. Um, Not many changes the Niners can really make to get better at this point, right? I mean, like, they're just dominant all around. Their only issue was they had some injuries in the secondary uh, this season with Hufanga. But if the secondary can stay healthy, get a little help, healthier, I should say, uh, maybe they win. But it's always going to be Super Bowl or bust with this core. And, like, who are you, who are you going to get rid of? How are you going to make this team better? So I think it's just you just got to keep running this core out and hope you eventually luck into one. Because when you have a team this good, especially if maybe you get, like, Kansas City has a big injury or uh, maybe the Lions have a big injury in the NFC, you're going to be able to skate to what's funny. <laughs> Not just sneaking in the Lions with the Chiefs is funny. <laughs> I mean, they almost lost to the Lions on their way to no, play the Chiefs. I know. The last two funny. teams they played. It was just funny. There's no more sneaking the Lions in anymore. They're in. <laughs> but regardless, maybe they catch some breaks, but you're not going to be able to make this team better. They're already so amazing. So we'll see how they do. Yeah. I mean, Purdy was pretty good. CMC, easily the best running back in the league and all around just weapons in the league as well. Ayuk had a great breakout season. Uh, he was their leading receiver, but I don't even know what they're going to do with him. Are they going to trade him? Because uh, his, I think it was his brother that posted like, yeah, this is why we leave San Francisco. Uh, you don't give your uh, leading receiver only three catches in the Super Bowl, or like something like that. But Debo was really good as well. The defense was really good, anchored by Javon Hargrave, who was a new acquisition from last year in free agency. Nick Bosa, uh, Hufanga, who before he got hurt, at least in the secondary, Traverius Ward, Fred Warner. Uh, Drake Greenlaw, and they had a great playoff run, but they just didn't get it done when it mattered most in the Super Bowl. But like you said, Josh, it's hard to fire a guy when he loses to arguably one of the best uh, coach quarterback duos in league history, Mahomes and Reed. They're just so good. It's You just can't fire a guy for losing to Mahomes. Yeah, I have the same thing. Uh, basically, you guys, there's really not much this team can do to get better. Uh, they were so close, up by 10 again in the Super Bowl, and were unable to finish the job. Uh, the Drake Greenlaw injury was mi just such a rough thing to happen, just running on the field in the Super Bowl, and now he has a torn Achilles is going to miss most of next season. Uh, a lot of went wrong in that football game for him with the CMC fumble, the, the muff punt. They just made too many mistakes in the big game, and it didn't go their way. Uh, but they just have so many elite players at every level. I mean, Kittle, one of the best tight ends in the league, finished with over 1,000 yards. Ayuk was phenomenal, finished with 1,342 receiving yards. Debo, obviously, CMC was the offensive player of the year. He was great. Brock Purdy was an MVP candidate for most of the season, was the favorite at a point. And defensively, they have just as many studs, like you guys said, Traverius Ward, Javon Hargrave, Eric Armstead. Uh, the list just goes on and on. Fred Warner and Drake Greenlaw are one of the best linebacker duos in the entire NFL. Nick Posa off the edge. They traded for Chase Young to add to more depth off the edge. Um, the only really negative that they had throughout the season was losing Hufunga to an injury that uh, put him out for the rest of the season. But one injury you should be able to overcome, especially if it's in a, the secondary. Um, I don't really know what they could do to get better. It's really just you have to just make the plays late in the season to win the game, be clutch. 
They fired Steve Wilkes, their defensive coordinator, after the Super Bowl. Uh, maybe a scapegoat. I think it's more just probably coaching differences between him and Shanahan. They brought in Nick Sorensen to be their new DC. He was their defensive passing game coordinator and their Nichols coach. Uh, but like I said, not much they could do to really improve this roster. It's just a matter of making the plays in the big games to finally put you over the hump. Yep, and that about does it for this episode of the Engage A Podcast, episode 50, the big 5-0. Um, we will be back next week to talk about the AFC and NFC North, as well as I'm assuming we'll touch on some March Madness bracket stuff as well with the bracket coming out on Sunday and conference tournaments finishing up on Sunday as well. Uh, until then, follow all of our links in the description, Spotify, TikTok, uh, everything that we got down there. We'll see everybody in the next one.